Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. We have another first look for House of the Dragon Season 2 episodes with a teaser for some really important scenes between Aegon II and Larys Strong, Sir Weird Footstuff himself, who has been elevated to the Green Council since the end of Season 1, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. They just finished filming Season 2, so we'll probably get some more trailer footage, some teasers by later this year, too. The other really good news recently is that HBO kind of let out that they were about to fast track season three because of the writer's strike ending. They want the showrunner Ryan Condal, George R. R. Martin to get season three going as fast as possible, which is great because it means there's a good chance that it could get out within a year of season two and no more waiting billions of years, eons between seasons. But recently, you may have seen the teaser in your feeds, the scene between Aegon II and Lara Strong. We got part of this scene, little teaser, the two of them, that takes place later in the season, probably going to be episode five, just based on what's happening in the actual scene. This is meant to happen after the Battle of Rook's Rest, after what's going on in this scene here, with the Green Army marching through the streets of King's Landing in a big celebration of their victory in the recent battle. The interesting thing, too, is that we actually got this scene from the rap celebration, like it was them celebrating them finishing all the episodes. They filmed them out of order. The last big thing we know that they were filming was the battle at Rook's Rest, but that's going to take place in the middle of the season, not at the end of the season. Zoom and enhance at the top here. This is the actual scene, and this quote is taken between Aegon and Larys Strong. It's Larys congratulating him, stroking his ego as much as possible, telling him what a special little boy he is. Larys says, you've already written yourself into legend. You survived Dragonfire. That's meant to be a line of dialogue taken directly from the Fire and Blood book about the Targaryen history from after the battle at Rook's Rest. And what's happened is that during the battle, Aegon is gravely wounded but survives. So he's lying there on the edge of death recovering and Lara Strong comes along to congratulate him on not dying like, hey, you're alive, this is great. Basically trying to stroke his ego by saying that his victory and survival will become legendary, which it does not. And the whole line about surviving Dragonfire is Larys leaning into the whole idea that Targaryens believe themselves to be fireproof. Historically, Targaryens believe themselves to essentially be part dragons themselves, and thus that gives them an immunity to fire. Can you do that for me? You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Here's the thing, though. That's not totally true. Even though they portrayed things a little bit differently during the original Game of Thrones series, the difference there is that we didn't see that many Targaryens. There have been a number of times in the books that have proven that wrong, also on that original Game of Thrones series. For example, right now in what's happening in House of the Dragon, Daemon Targaryen, who's one of the most old school Targaryens there is, he'll go on all day about how they're dragons themselves. And this is what his wound looks like from a flaming arrow that he took during a battle in season one. Notice his skin is severely burned, clearly not immune to fire. Way back in the original Game of Thrones series during season one, Daenerys' brother Viserys II, named for Rhaenyra's father, Viserys I, he always kept spouting on about his temper, don't wake the dragon, Daenerys, and he's definitely not immune to fire. The best example of this phenomenon, though, when people talk about Targaryens not being immune to fire, is the Targaryen prince who tried to drink wildfire unsuccessfully. This is actually during the time of Duncan Egg, real name Aegon V Targaryen, who became the eventual king of Westeros, a little over 100 years after what's happening on Dance of the Dragons. They'll actually be covering that period during the Tales of Duncan Egg during the next Game of Thrones prequel series they just announced. The current title for that is A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. I think it'll premiere in like the next two, maybe three years, depending on how fast they go. So we might actually get to see that Targaryen prince try to drink the wildfire and just get burned alive. It should also be noted that wildfire is a different type of fire than dragon fire is also a different type of fire than regular fire, like when you burn wood. Wildfire is a chemical concoction. Dragon fire is like a totally different magical kind of fire, like it's actual magic, according to George R. R. Martin. It burns way, way harder than natural fire. Wildfire is more like the Game of Thrones version of Greek fire. That totally sounds like the title of a YouTube video, like top 10 types of fire inside Game of Thrones. But either way, it's been proven not all Targaryens are immune to fire. That was just meant to be Daenerys. And when you see other people being immune to fire like the Night King, that's because of magic. George R. R. Martin also said that Daenerys being immune to fire was meant to be a special thing in the Song of Ice and Fire, also implying some ancient dragon magic. But here's the thing, though. Even though a lot of them lie about being immune to fire, when they say that they're all part dragon, like the Targaryens say that they're part dragon, even Daemon boasting about it, they're not totally wrong about that. Part of the whole reason why Targaryens and people of Valyrian blood mostly can bond with dragons is because of the special magical techniques used by the ancient Valyrian blood mages in the Freehold. 
Way back during season one, when Allison was younger and Viserys was telling her all these stories about his model of the Valyrian freehold, he was talking about the Nagrion. This is where the ancient Valyrian blood mages practiced their secret arts. Part of their now lost techniques, their lost magic, was intermingling dragon DNA in the DNA of the greater Valyrian houses in the freehold. So essentially they were making people descended from those bloodlines part dragon. Now, not every Valyrian could bond with dragons. It was only meant to be the greater houses, but there were many of them in the Freehold at its peak. So you have to imagine over many thousands of years, thousands of them having thousands of bastards, and the bloodline just sort of dilutes from there on and on. And you don't need to be a pure blood to bond with dragons. You only need to be loosely related to them. So essentially, the real reason why dragons obey them and bond with them is because they're sensing the dragon DNA in them, and there's also a little bit of magic kind of mixed in with that because of the blood mages. And the dragons think of the Targaryens now in present day as their own. Like, oh, you're just like us. Now, on top of that, they also form familial attachments with them from the time that they're hatched. That's why they put dragon eggs in the baby's cribs to start that as early as possible. So when they're born, the dragons will imprint on them. But also the fact that they're sensing sort of like the low level dragon DNA inside them also helps that a lot. This is also why after a dragon rider dies, their dragon can be claimed and bonded with by someone else because the dragon is also sensing the dragon DNA in that new person and thinks of them as one of their kind like, oh, you're cool, we can be friends. But when dragons bond with humans, the dragons also take on personality traits of their riders. So for instance, Damon's dragon, Caraxes, has a personality like Damon's, very mercurial. They also say this is true of like dogs in real life, even though the way they portray dragons on the Game of Thrones series House of the Dragon is a little bit more like large cats. There are actually three main houses in Game of Thrones who can say that they're of Valyrian descent. The Targaryens, obviously, the Valerians, who were a shipfaring family that didn't originally have the ability to bond with dragons. The reason why some people inside their family can bond with dragons like Laenor, like Bela, like Rhaena, is because over time you have a lot of Valerians marrying with Targaryens, so they get part of that dragon bonding DNA intermingled that way. So for instance, that's why Corlys Valerian cannot bond with dragons, but his son Laenor could. Same thing with Daemon and his daughters Bela and Rhaena. Bela and Rhaena would have gotten the dragon bonding DNA no matter what because their mother Lena also got it from Princess Rhaenys. It was just a plus that their father was also Daemon. It's kind of the same situation with House Celtigar, like they're a lesser house of Valyrian descent, but they do not have dragons. But some of them in their family can bond with dragons. Most of though for the same reasons, because of long-term intermarriage with Targaryens, other ancient Valyrians that did have dragon bonding DNA. But in present day, the whole idea is that the entire realm was terrified of dragons. They were like nuclear weapons controlled solely by the Targaryens for the most part. So all of them leaned on that as a way to keep the realm in line. Like the threat of dragons a lot of time was more effective than them actually taking a dragon and burning down one of the different realms. Also caused way less collateral damage. That's changed in present day because of the Dance of the Dragons because that's a civil war within the house and both sides have dragons. So that's part of the reason why you have Larys Strong boasting, trying to pump him up, saying that he's immune to fire because he is Targaryen. Even though clearly it's not true. One of the other funny things about the grains too is that they're relying heavily on the Targaryen brand to legitimize or to strengthen Aegon's claim to the Iron Throne, when really Allison actually can't stand all the Targaryen stuff. The showrunners explained the way that they played her characters that during the time jump, essentially she found religion in a much bigger way than she had before. Her family, the High Towers, historically had always had a very close relationship with the Faith of the Seven. Their seat of power is Old Town, and Old Town used to be the main capital city of Westeros until Aegon's conquest. So for many hundreds of years after the Faith of the Seven was brought to Westeros by the Andals, the original Great Sept, the original High Septon, were in Old Town near the High Towers. So even though in present day you have Alicent leaning heavily into the Faith of the Seven, trying to get away from all this Targaryen stuff, the Greens are relying so heavily on the brand and also on the idea that Aegon is the oldest living male heir. This is part of the reason why he was named Aegon in the first place, why they use Aegon the Conqueror's crown during his coronation, and why they gave him the Blackfire Valyrian sword, it's Aegon's ancestral blade. To be fair though, when he was named Aegon, Alicent, when she was much much younger, wasn't thinking about all this battle for the succession stuff. Most of that started with Otto Hightower the minute the Aegon was born, like the wheels in his head started turning like, okay, we need to find a way to put this boy on the Iron Throne. So in present day, Otto Hightower wants Aegon II to seem to the people, like to the populace, is the actual second coming of Aegon the Conqueror. So he's got his name, he's wearing the same crown made of Valyrian steel no less, and he's got his same Valyrian sword. The other thing about that Valyrian sword too is that that had always been passed down from Aegon the Conqueror to each successive king. That's why Viserys had it. 
even though there is no way he looks strong enough to swing that around. He was way more of a history nerd than he was a big fighter. In reality, in present day, even though you have this giant battle for the succession of the Dance of the Dragons, most of the Greens don't actually care about the actual Valyrian customs or Targaryen cultural practices or the lore. That's why Alicent never really cared about all the Viserys' stories, the Valyrian history, or his toy model replica, the Valyrian Freehold. Most of the time, she just sat there and humored him because she wanted to make him happy. And on the other side of that, what she was getting out of it, at least at first when she was younger, like these types of scenes, according to the showrunner, the way they played it, was that Viserys was one of the few people inside the Red Keep that actually seemed like he saw her and treated her with respect, like an actual person. Whereas people like her father, Otto Hightower, pretty much everybody else for the most part everywhere either treated her like she didn't exist at all or she existed to be a piece of property that they just expected to do whatever anyone told her to do. Now obviously in present day with the Dance of the Dragons, everything's completely changed. But bringing things back around to Sir Weird Footstuff is we have a couple other scenes of him at the Red Keep, at Harrenhal, and since the end of season one, Allison has elevated him to the Green Council as the Master of Whispers, essentially the Crown Spy Master. That was the role that Viserys had. He was Master of Whispers to Aerys II, the Mad King, before Robert Baratheon. The actual position was created after the time of Aegon the Conqueror, though. It was Magor the Cruel who started it, and it was one of his wives called Tiana the Tower, supposedly his most feared wife. She became the first one, basically doing the same thing that Varys did that Lair Strong is doing now. And on the other side of this, to talk about Rhaenyra's side of things, Maseria, through her association with Daemon, has become Rhaenyra's Mistress of Whispers. The other big thing with his character is that Laris has also become the Lord of Harrenhal after he killed his father and brother back in season one, but that happened much earlier and it was more of an automatic hereditary title. Being named to the Green Council was a bigger favor Allison paid him back for in exchange for giving her information on pretty much everything since she was younger in this moment here, like this is where their relationship began. She basically owed him a lot and he had a ton, a ton of dirt on everyone, including her. That's also why he was forcing her to do all the weird foot stuff. Basically him lording his power over her. Cannot wait to see what kind of weird, depraved stuff he makes her do in season two. Post all your theories about that in the comments below. The other big thing about this teaser for the scene between Aegon and Laris is that it's notable because it pays off Helena's dragon dream from season one. The last ring has no legs, meaning Aegon can no longer walk. Now that they've finally finished filming, we might get another teaser or trailer pretty soon. So of course I'll do videos for everything they wind up releasing. We do know that season two, episode one will be blood and cheese. I might do a longer video about them at some point, but if you do have any bonus video requests or questions about any of the characters or the plot, let me know in the comments. They also just released a teaser for the White Walkers and the Whites coming back in season two. Click here to watch that and click here for that Game of Thrones, Night of the Seven Kingdoms trailer video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.